Today on Sports Card Investor, eBay is showing off some brand new tech that will change how you list sports cards in the future. Plus, an important update on eBay's standard envelope shipping option. My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me on my journey to profit from the hobby we all love. Sports Card Investors, and welcome to a really cool episode because you are about to see some new technology that could become a real game changer in how you list your sports cards for sale. Now, you guys know eBay is a sponsor of this show, and they recently reached out to me and said, Hey, look at this new tech that we have been working on. And I said, Oh, this is pretty cool image recognition with how cards can quickly be taken from your phone and put up for sale. I said, the audience is going to want to see this. And so that's what we are going to do during today's show. And I also wanted to talk to them about the eBay standard envelope program, a new shipping option, which launched a few months ago to much fanfare. But there have been some questions I've heard from some of you out in the audience about questions and concerns regarding how the tracking of those envelopes is taking place with the Postal Service. So I'm going to ask him those questions and we're going to get some answers today. I'm going to bring on Bob Means. He's the director of trading cards at eBay, a very knowledgeable guy. And he's going to show us all of this. He's going to do a live demo of this new technology. I'm really, really excited for this. And before I bring him on, do me one favor. If you haven't yet hit that subscribe button, and hit that little bell icon. We are getting closer and closer to 100,000 subscribers. That is our goal for the year. So help us out, hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell icon. We appreciate each and every one of you who subscribe to our channel. All right, guys, without further ado, let's bring Bob onto Sports Card Investor. Bob, welcome to Sports Card Investor. Hi there, Jeff, thanks. Good, good to be here. Yeah, I am so excited. I know the audience is going to dig seeing this new eBay technology that you guys just put out. And I know you've put it out in the world of trading card games, but it's something that I, I hope is soon going to come to sports cards too. So let's actually just right off the bat show an audience, show the audience the demo of, of what we're looking at here. Yeah, sure. Let me, uh, let me walk you through that. Um, currently you're right. It's only for magic, the gathering. Um, but by the, by next week after this airs, we're actually going to have Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh added. So that's going to be really cool. Um, and then I'll get back to the sports card question in a second, but let me show you the technology. Okay. So anyways, there's my eBay homepage, uh, down on the lower right-hand corner, you see there's a selling tab. So if I went to that, it's going to tell me that I can list an item and it's going to give me some of my information of what my personal store has done in the last 90 days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I go to list an item. This is going to come up for anybody. So if you were doing sports mem, if you were selling a pair of shoes, if you were selling a, a rake, you're going to see this and you would type in, I'm selling a rake, right? But if I type MTG or Magic the Gathering, I'm going to get this little prompt to tap my, to search with my camera. I hit that. And the camera comes up and it's going to start looking for a card. And in this case, I've got something called a mall splicer. Okay, so this is a card you have there. So you just moved your camera over top of that. Whoa, what's what what's just happened there, Bob? Uh, so it it uh, outside of my over caffeinated hand shaking all over the place, uh, it found the match. So there you see it said MTG mall splicer, new Phyrexia, regular common. Uh, that might mean nothing to you, Jeff, and I won't hold you accountable for that. But that means something to the people that play Magic the Gathering, right? Right. And so that is the right card. I know that that's the right card. So I'm going to accept it and it's going to take me into the listing flow now. And so now what I'm seeing is it wants photos. So, you know, on eBay, we always want to have uh, actual photos of the item. So it's going to trigger a photo phase. Again, my camera is going to come up, take a picture. I'm actually going to take a picture of all four. And I'll explain that in a second. I hit done and you're going to see that the photos start loading up. I can move on from this point. And now I'm in, now I'm sort of in the listing summary and here come the photos. Um, seems a little bit lagged with the sc screen share, but uh, that's okay. There it goes. Um, so again, you see the title came in based off of the, the information behind the scenes. I'm actually going to edit that 
because I want people to know that I'm selling four of them. And I want people to know that they are lightly played. Then I'm gonna get into the item specifics. I just have to change this to used. And just really quick on this. So like we're learning about this as we go. And uh, most any card you sell raw is technically used, right? So, you know, we're gonna get feedback on this and should this just be a default thing? That's the only thing I need to add currently. And then you see all these item specifics that again, these mean something to a match the gathering player. They know it's used, they know it's a creature, they know what set it came from. That's probably the more valuable thing. They know the name of it, the mall splicer. And so all the listing is already pre-populated. All of that helps with search. The more information you ever put into any list. So again, if you're selling a basketball, the more you can tell about that basketball, the better the search results are going to be for you. Right. So in this case, by simply taking that photo using this new recognition feature in eBay, it just automatically creates the title and it automatically creates all of these listing details for you. That's right. All the critical, all the critical aspects are added in there. And in the old world, most people didn't even put this much detail in there because it's hard. You'd be sitting, you know, especially on your phone, you'd be with my big fat thumbs. I would, it would probably take me 10 minutes to get all of this information in there. Right. So it's called new phyrexia wrong 13 times. Right. So anyways, this just speeds up that entire process, automates it quite a bit. You see that it goes into the appropriate category. It adds a description. And then uh, the, the critical st step would be pricing. So I'm going to go in there. I'm going to say I'm going to price it. I'm actually not going to do an auction. It, it defaults to auction. Another thing we want to learn about, should we default to auction? Should we default to buy it now? Auction is so important in the trading card business, right? Like we way over index in auction sales in trading cards. People like it, right? It, and so we, we'll probably stick with this, but we'll see what the feedback is. But anyways, I'm going to turn off by uh, auction. So buy it now lights up. And then kind of a cool thing, um, see how other prices, see how other sellers priced it, right? So not always, but there's a huge database behind all of this. And if we have a clean data connection, we should be able to give you some good price guidance. So for instance, I can see that somebody else sold one of these. Again, this is not a super expensive card, but somebody else sold one of these for 99 cents and threw 49 cents shipping on it. So cool, nice little piece of Intel for me. I'm actually going to price this then at a buck 50. And then the next thing that I would do is I would figure out my shipping method, delivery. And I already have ESE applied, which is our, our service under $20, right? So that's already a default option for me. If I were selling a $50 card or a $100 card or something, I'd go in here and I'd change the UPS, uh, USPS first class or whatever service it is that I, I prefer to use for something a little higher end. But basically, we're done. And so I can go through all these things. There's an op option to promote your listing if you want. You can donate to charity, all that good stuff. But basically, here's the magic button. You list your item and the listing is live. And so, you know, without talking through the process, I probably could have knocked that out in a, in a minute and a half. You sure. know, going full speed. And uh, so that's really, really, really going to be good for your average C2C seller. You know, this is not a tool for a big big house to use that's listing thousands of cards a day, but this is going to be really great for your, you know, your, your hobbyist and your guy who's got a small collection and he's trying to buy and sell. Um, I also, I'm going to show you one more thing just because I think it's important. I'm going to, so I'm going to go through the same process. So here we go. I'm going to do this a little bit faster. I won't do the whole thing, but in magic specifically, there's a lot of cards like this one that have tons of matching products. So you see that. So now seven things came back. So it's incumbent on me as the seller to have some idea what I'm talking about, right? And, uh, you know, I, I, in sports cards, I don't know if this is really going to be an issue because most of them are fairly mutually exclusive. They're all either this or they're that, where in Magic and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh, they reprint a lot of these cards. But I could imagine a world where, you know, if you've got the famous Jordan, which I think has an authorized reprint, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but, you know, right. that would it would recognize that card, but you would have to say, no, this is an authorized reprint versus the other one, or technically you're doing a, a listing wrong. So anyways, in this case, I do know that this one happens to be a fourth edition, so I would click the right one, and it's gonna take me to that same process that I was just walking you through, needs the photo. And again, this is a card that would be worth a little bit more, so I'd have to change my shipping and all that good stuff, but 
no need to go through that whole process again. So Bob, from the consumer standpoint, for the person selling their cards on eBay, I assume the thought process here was, let's speed that up. Let's make it quicker for somebody to get more cards on eBay more quickly. Was that the goal? That was the goal. I mean, kind of a staggering number that I, I, I think your audience will appreciate. There's 150 cards listed per minute on eBay. And so, you know, anything we can do to make that easier is just going to be in everyone's best interest. That's more inventory getting on the site. That's more things for people to search. There, that's that's more cards transacting. So that's certainly a goal of ours. And then the other piece of this is obviously um, really reaching out to the smaller buyer and the smaller seller. Like the most of our guys in this category and all of them, sports cards, uh, trading card, uh, collectible card games, non-sports trading cards, they're buyers and sellers, right? They're they're in the mix and they're doing both of these things. We absolutely have people who are just buyers. We absolutely have people who are just sellers. But your average C to C guy, your average small time uh, seller is doing this as a hobby. And this should make life a lot easier for them. Yeah, for sure. And the other benefit that you that you kind of briefly touched on that I want to call out because, man, this is a huge benefit to people like me who are creating software that allow you to track, you know, price movements of sports cards, right? Our, our sports card investor app, market movers, et cetera, is that this is a move towards eBay standardizing the listing data and making more listing data available. By, by scanning a card, you can then have eBay suggest to you a proper, you know, a proper title, fill in all of the listing details, which that type of standardization is going to make eBay better and easier to search in the future. And it's also going to make tools like the Sports Card Investor app and Market Movers more effective because we can get a better feed from eBay in terms of what card is what. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's absolutely true. And um, I love the idea of somebody being able to hop in, scan a card, go through that process and, you know, go through an old shoebox that they found in their in their attic or something and find out they've got a couple gems in there. I think that would be a lot of fun for people. Um, so absolutely, this this is this is incumbent on us improving the catalog behind the scenes, um, but that work is always in process. And uh, you know, quite frankly, to answer your question about sports cards, absolutely, we want to get sports cards in there. Pokemon, Magic, Yu-Gi-Oh, they have fairly contained catalogs, right? Like their Magic's been around, I think, twenty five years. Is I think they just had their twenty fifth year or something. But and then from there on out, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, or even younger. And it's a self-contained catalog. Sports cards go back over a hundred years and getting that data is going to be a challenge. It's, it's a massive amount of information. Um, and so we have to do all that work before we can bring this experience live with sports cards, but it's absolutely the goal. We have to make it happen. Uh, it's critical. And, and quite frankly, this is the way that people want to shop now. And this is the way that people like the mobile experience is what it's all about. Definitely, I'm sure a lot of people like to get on their desktops to do their deep dives into everything and, and really do their research. But anything we can do to make it a little bit easier for everybody is in everyone's best interest. Yeah, 100%. And sports cards, as you said, it's going to be more challenging to get off the ground, I suspect. I mean, that's awesome, first of all, what you've done uh, there so far with the trading card games. That's great to see. And I'm so excited about the possibility of this coming to sports cards. But what I foresee is, you know, you're going to have cards like, for example, like Kobe Bryant's Topps Rookie card. That's going to be, it's a fairly standard card design. It's, you know, there's a lot of these out there. I imagine that's going to be a relatively easy card to catalog. But then you're going to get into cards that have, you know, patches and, and you know, various things going on. And not every patch is going to be the same. This card happens to be a one of one, right? This Kyler Murray uh, card is a one of one card. So it, it's even going to be hard to get a historical photo on that. Or you could end up with, um, you know, cards that are are like, a, you know, again, another kind of real unique patch with a signature where the signature is going to vary from card to card. This is a James Harden uh, Logo Man rookie card. And so uh, is that some of the challenge that you guys are going to have to figure out how to overcome technically within the world of sports cards? Yeah, it, I mean, that's exactly the challenge. Um, you know, my guy growing up was Willie McCovey and I've got a Willie McCovey card. The card's beautiful. It's got a little swatch of his uniform in there. And that swatch of uniform is just white. It's just blank. There's nothing on it. So I don't have any cards of those exist, but I assume there's ones out there with little orange stripes in it, little black stripes in it, maybe a little piece of the number, maybe, you know, 
maybe a little orange and black. And each one of those cards right now, our system would think is mutually exclusive and we need it to not know that. The signature thing is a huge challenge, right? I mean, hypothetically, the signature is always gonna be really closely matching, right? You would hope it's gonna be very similar, but they don't sign in the same spot. They don't do this. Um, so we'll, we'll phase it out. Like the, the first thing will be to figure out the cards that are really easy. Like, a, like you, you showed the Kobe, which is, it's a Kobe, it's a Kobe, it's a Kobe, right? Like those ones will be a little bit easier to get into place. And it'll take us a while to, to find some of these additional things. And, uh, you know, the other thing you brought up is, is in this industry, there's all those one of ones. What do we do with those? They exist. Um, you know, we're, we have a lot of great conversations about do we, do we engage with our, if, with our sellers and our buyers to help them make the catalog, right? Like, hey, I've got this cool card. It's not showing up in your, in your listing. I'm going to take a photo and hit a button and that's going to come into our database. We'll be like, oh my God, okay, great. Let's build some catalog data behind that one if that ever comes up. And we also have a challenge around grading. You know, ultimately, um, I'd love to see I'd love to see this get extended to graded cards as well. That's a totally different scan now. Now you're looking at a barcode or a serial number or a, in CGC they have the little um, QR code. You know, there's different ways of getting that information. So we need to add flexibility to the system as well. So this is going to expand. It's going to get bigger and bigger. Um, one of the reasons why you saw that lag when I took the photo is we we know that we'll never be able to keep this self-contained on someone's phone. No one's going to want the sports card catalog on their phone. They wouldn't ever be able to take a picture again, right? So we have to keep all of that information offsite so that you're pinging the system to get the information. Um, that causes it to slow down a little bit, but it allows us to ultimately have that catalog of that size that we're talking about. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a bigger challenge uh, to, you know, to do that with sports cards, as you talked about, but the payoff is massive. I mean, I can only imagine how incredible it would be if you could literally take a photo of a card and have all the eBay details filled in and you'd be able to get that up on eBay immediately to sell. It would just make that buyer and that, that selling process uh, so much more frictionless, right? Which is what it's all about. It's about increasing the speed. That's really, really cool. And I know, um, I know eBay has, it seems like you guys have made a push in recent months to get more raw cards and more lower dollar cards on eBay for sale. I, I know the eBay standard envelope program, which we'll talk about in a minute, was oriented at helping sellers who want to sell lower dollar raw cards. I imagine some of the thought process behind this was also probably oriented around, hey, this will speed up. If someone's got a bunch of raw cards and they want to get them up on eBay to quickly sell them, this will probably speed that up, which ultimately will give you guys a wider catalog of, of different cards available for sale in your marketplace. Yeah. I mean, the single biggest reason for coming up with ESC and, and, and uh, with eBay standard envelope um, was to try to decrease the amount of transactions or shipments, I should say, in this case, that people just use a stamp. Um, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong when you only use a stamp. And uh, adding, adding a tracking element at a stamped cost was, was really the primary thing that we were looking for. The additional benefits that come from it with like getting some tracking um, allows our sellers who mainly stay, stay down on the low end to uh, achieve top rated seller status at eBay and that takes a cut off of their final value fee. So there's also that benefit. Um, and those two things were really the primary driving force of why we wanted to come up with this with this whole system. The flip side of that is we also had people, you know, sent, selling $10 cards and having to use $3.50 shipping first class. You know, it was just eating up all of their margins as well. So, um, you know, there's a lot of wins that come from ESE. The number one thing is the tracking. Um, it's not perfect. You know, like there's, there's weird situations where I live, I live near San Francisco. So if I ship from my house to San Francisco, that card's probably never going to go through a hub, in which case it may make it all the way to the, to the uh, person who bought from me without getting any tracking notification. But eBay knows that I tried to track it. They know that I printed a, a, an ESC label and they know that I tried to do it. If it goes across the country, you're gonna get tracking hits. It's gonna leave my house. It won't hit the local post office, but it'll hit Oakland. And from Oakland, it'll hit say New York. And then from New York, it won't hit the little local one in New York. And then it's gonna to get to somebody who lives in that area, right? So there are places where there's still room for improvement. We like, we're continuing to talk with, you know, how can we make this even better? But the, the basic goal is to let buyers feel comfortable that they know that their stuff's on the way and let sellers feel comfortable that there's some sort of tracking mechanism for them to know that the item was indeed delivered. 
Uh, yeah. Just really quick, a couple quick numbers for you. Um, you know, it's only been out for uh, a couple months now. We're already up to 2 million units shipped or 2 million ESC shipments done. And we've already replaced almost half of what used to be untracked shipments with ESC. So that's a lot of, that's, that's just great news for me. And I, and, you know, we need to dig into why are we only at half? Like who are these people that are still using stamps and why are they using stamps? Do they not know about ESC? Do we need to get more information out there to them? Um, you know, but we're going to keep working on that. We're going to keep iterating on it. We're going to keep, keep trying to make it better. And it's been successful enough that we need to start looking at other things too, right? We need to start looking at higher ends. We need to start figuring out what's the best shipping models. Are there ways that we can help that model too? Yeah, that's really awesome information. Thank you for sharing that and with ESE's gro growth. So, I, so just first of all, for anyone watching who's not familiar with the ESE program, the eBay Standard Envelope program, what does that offer to the buyer and seller? Yeah, I, I should probably get, go through the basic facts. So for the seller, it's about a 50 cent stamp. Um, if you do, you know, just keep it easy. It's a 51 cent stamp. But if you if you do more stuff, like if you send it in a top loader, you might get over two ounces, in which case it jumps up to 71 cents. And in some cases, maybe you're sell sending one of those, you know, those thicker baseball cards or something that are almost a quarter inch thick. And that somehow gets up to three ounces. So potentially you can ship up to three ounces. Again, cards are super lightweight. The most common thing is to keep it under an ounce. So it's 51 cents. Um, it, it allows you to, you know, it allows you to achieve top rated status. So that's a 10% reduction on your final value fee when you get that. And that just shows to get that, you have to have tracked shipping service. Um, and then again, the obvious thing for a seller is once you start getting into that 10 to $20 range, you're significantly improving your profit margin. If you had been one of these people that were shipping that at 350 or 325 with USPS first class or some other first class service, right? So now you're making $3 on each one of those cards where you were making, you know, $3 less. Um, for the buyer, you're getting tracked notifications. You have to go into your eBay and look at your purchase history. And as long as, again, like I was saying, that card hit one of the major hubs to get to you, you're going to get a better idea of when it's coming. And then obviously, if we see a delivery made, that helps us from a, from a, from a uh, help desk perspective to help resolve things like, hey, I never got my card. And we can, we can see, oh, you know what, you, it was delivered. So it helps us sort of remediate some of those issues that, that might occur um, when the transaction goes a little sideways. But again, the, the frequency of, of a card being lost in the mail or whatever when someone was using a stamp was significantly higher than you know, any, any reasonable amount of USPS mail loss. Like I always joke, they never seem to lose my taxes or my bills, <laughs> but um, somehow they were losing cards left and right. So that's really our goal. We want the buyers to have confidence. We want the sellers to have confidence. We want people to be able to do a tremendous amount of, of uh, sales at this level. We also, we love the big ones too, of course, right? But um, the small ones are really the bread and butter of the collector and the hobbyist. Uh, just as a number, I think I shared 150 cards per minute listed. It's 130 cards sold per minute. So tremendous velocity. And, and the vast majority of our cards, cards are all obviously down on the lower end. Um, so, you know, it's important to try to improve that service as much as we can. Yeah, for sure. And and the eBay uh, standard envelope service, just to be clear, that's is that that's an automatic option to sellers who are listing cards under $20, right? They have to select that as their shipping option when they go to list it? Yeah, that's right. So as long as the card is under $20, our system knows to look for that. So if you put a $25 card in there, it's not even gonna offer it as, a, it's gonna be grayed out as an option, right? But if you're listing a $19 card, $19.99, $20, whatever under that, it'll be an option available to you. Again, there's some nuances here and there's a lot of information on, on eBay.com for people to get to this. Mm -hmm. You know, as an example, we have people that sell lots. So you could sell 20 cards for under $20, and that would be under three ounces, but 20 cards is going to get too thick. So there are some other things out there, like you can't be over a quarter inch in thickness. It's got to be a standard envelope, um, you know, those kind of things. Basically, you have to imagine that the card's got to be able to make it through uh, a sorting system. And if it's too thick, it's going to jam up on it, some conveyor belt someplace. So there's some there's some additional details out there, but to keep it really simple. If you're selling a single card and it's under twenty bucks, it's the best thing. It's the best system for you to be using. Yeah, and I, and I know some people. We heard from actually a number of our viewers after eBay Standard Envelope was originally put out there and people started using it for the first time. 
they thought that that something was wrong, that it was broken because when they dropped them off at their post office, they wouldn't necessarily immediately get scanned and tracked the same way that a normal package with tracking does. And what you're saying is that's actually okay and that's expected. Part of this program is that it gets scanned a little less. It gets scanned as it goes through the major hubs. It doesn't necessarily get scanned on drop off, but that's okay. That doesn't mean that the system's not working. Yeah, we're aware of that. Again, we're working on seeing if we can improve that. But um, basically, you need that card to go through a, a, a hub someplace mm -hmm. to, to start triggering that scan process. Uh, once it goes through any major hub, you're probably going to see a complete scanning scenario. Like, if you're selling something locally, you won't. It'll, it'll happen. But again, eBay will pay attention to that. You're not, you're, no one's going to get their account de um there's not going to be a defect put against your account. We clear all that stuff up on a, in a, in a rolling, with a rolling calendar sort of process. Um, and we're trying to expedite that too. We're trying to make it so that there's just no chance that you get a defect um, when you use this service, unless something legitimately goes wrong where you, know, you, you print the purchase label, which is our system thinking that you're going to ship it in the next 24 hours. And then it sits on your desk for four weeks, right? Like that's still a mistake. But um, anything like the local post office not scanning, it's perfectly fine. Bob, this has been great stuff. Are there any other advancements or technologies uh, coming down the pipe from eBay? Well, we just announced that we're going to start accepting NFTs. Uh, so that's super exciting. NFTs kind of make my head explode. I, I, I can't totally grasp everything about them. It's just It seems just like this wild new technology. But eBay wants to get in there and figure out how to participate in that and add in blockchain technologies and all that good stuff that comes along with it. So that's going to be a real exciting thing to see uh, expand over the next few months. We'll wrap up with this, Bob. I know uh, eBay's had some big news recently uh, regarding, you know, kind of quarter one and some of the things that were achieved by eBay in quarter one, as well as different trends going on. What has what has it looked like from eBay's perspective with, you know, the heat around sports cards and trading cards? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was exciting in the in the last earnings release because our CEO took time to actually speak specifically about trading cards. And so for once, I can actually share this information without, you know, some suit coming after me. <laughs> but uh, so we did we sold nearly 18 million trading cards in the first quarter, like just a staggering amount of money. We did um, over a billion dollars. Um, so we're super proud of that. And that's just indicative of how incredible this market is right now. Uh, I have some I have some stats because I know you guys will eat these up. But just for the first quarter, you know, basketball was up almost 300 percent. Baseball was up almost 200 percent. Football was up over 300 percent. Uh, soccer was amazing. I think you talked about this on one of your shows like soccer just took off. It's still much smaller than the big three being basketball, football and um, baseball, of course. But boy, it just it just skyrocketed. And that was up over 1500 percent year over year. Um, the other one that's even crazier, but on a much smaller basis, tennis. And I think a lot of this was like Serena Williams cards and whatnot. And that's almost 5,000% year over year. Um, from a CCG perspective, I know not necessarily as exciting to your guys, but a lot of people that are in sports cards are also into on the CCG side. Pokemon's been the runaway and we've seen it in the news and uh, almost a thousand per, or over a thousand percent up in Pokemon. And magic continues to be super strong. It's great. Um, there's some interesting other, and we also have the non-sports trading card categories of so Star Wars cards, Garbage Pail Kids. Marvel was the winner there. And I think it, I, I, I'm guessing it has something to do with just how amazing the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe has got. Um, Garbage Pail Kids is hitting that sort of peak nostalgia phase. So anyways, Marvel's up over 700%. Garbage Pail Kids up over 250%. And then Star Wars continues just to, truck along it was like the original non-sports trading card continues to be super powerful in that in that category um and you know in general for the first quarter like the interesting thing here is is collectible card games from a growth perspective was actually the bigger one but if you think about what's happened in the last year sports cards was the first to take off and then collectible card games kind of lagged behind it a little bit so we're getting a really good quarter in collectible card games up over 500 percent um, but sports trading cards is up in general is, is over 300%. And then any of your guys who are selling on eBay, I expect that they have seen a, an increase in exports. 
Um, so everyone's in on this right now, right? Australia is buying from us. Uh, Canada is buying from us. Euro the European countries are buying from us. China is buying from us. Um, and a lot of that tends to be on these higher end things. Like it's not really worth your time to live in Australia and buy a $5 card, but it is worth your time to go out there and get a sweet Kobe or something like that and stick it in your collection. And of course, and, and you know, the, the correlations that you would expect, like um, soccer is huge in Europe. So a lot of the exports are heading that direction. Uh, basketball is huge in Australia. So a lot of that's going that way. Uh, so it's really fun to see this become kind of an international thing. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that international shipment is just a, an interesting thing that we need to figure out as well. Because if this is going to continue, you know, is there an option to send a little single card all the way to Australia in a way that is not going to have to, you know, go through everything that happens with international. So anyways, super exciting business happening from an export perspective growth everywhere in every single category within sports cards. Um, really, really exciting time to be a part of this business. It is, man. Those growth numbers are exceptional. They are music to my ears. They are music to my ears. I love the, I love the market continuing to go up. And one of the reasons why I remain super bullish on sports cards and trading cards as a long-term investment is because of the international expansion. And because it's not just US buyers, you, you need to be thinking about the growth, it's buyers all over the world. And so some of those international uh, statistics and mentions you threw out at the end there, I hope the audience takes note because if those markets continue to grow the way the US has grown, you know this the overall sports card market's gonna be really hot. Um, yeah. Bob, this has been great. Thank you so much for sharing. I know the audience is going to be excited about this and uh, we look forward to having you back on the show soon. Yeah, awesome. Great being here. Thank you for your time. Take care. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Bob. I thought that was really cool stuff. And if you like shopping on eBay and hunting for sports car deals on eBay, then you're going to want the Sports Card Investor app because it is populated every single day with thousands of new for sale listings from eBay for all of the hottest trending cards. It is a great way to shop and find great deals on eBay. Download the Sports Card Investor app by going into the App Store on your phone and searching for Sports Card Investor. It's completely free. Please hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed today's episode. Hit that little bell icon. We want to get to that 100,000 subscribers. We appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you back in a couple of days with our next episode. Take care.